Thank you. Uh, I'm super honored to be here with you guys. Uh, as Dom mentioned, I, I, well, he didn't mention this. I, I left grad school at Carnegie Mellon to join Unex, which is the startup that, where I started working with, with Don and learning about design from him. And I was this computer scientist with not a lot of appreciation for, for design or understanding. And after that, I, I, uh, for, after four or five years of working in that startup, I work on my own and then joined Autodesk. Um, and at Autodesk, we've been trying to combine these different worlds of, uh, you know, or programming on one side, design on the other side, looking at biology as a programming space, looking at other things that are like biology, but they're not exactly biological, um, but you can also program in a similar way. And that's a little bit of what I will be showing to you today. But before I do that, I want to get a quick read of what's your background. So let's say, how many of you have computer science background? OK, that's good to know. In, uh, in biology, something related to biology? OK, of course, art. Art is here also, by the way. Art Olsen, not to put you on the spot, from the Scripps Institute. He's been one of our collaborators. I'm so surprised to see you. I'm so happy. And, uh, and I think you would empathize with some of the points that Don has said, that we need some ways to combine this. But Art has been doing a lot of work in providing outreach besides his own research uh, in, in exposing the molecular world to, to many, many people, including the scientists who are not used to it. So I'll show maybe a little bit of that too. Um, okay, well, with that in mind, I'll start by showing a little bit about Autodesk. Have you heard of Autodesk? Okay, so uh, let's see. So let's see if this is gonna play. Uh, okay. So this is what our group, what, what the company does in general, and I think it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't connect to the audio correctly. Uh, Sound, right now. Where is sound? Right, right. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, down, down. Oh, okay, <laughs> Tunnel vision when you're a little bit nervous. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. I like your voice user interface. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if this is going to work. Should work. OK. Almost over. So that gives you a glimpse of the things we help people do. Um, there are about 180 million users. Uh, 
it's interesting to notice that, um, well, one is not just about modeling, it's also modeling the real world, but also creating art, you know, virtual worlds for movies, for example. Every, I think every movie in the last 10 years that has been nominated for a uh, computer graphics um, uh, award in the academy um, uses our software in one way or another. And the other thing that is also interesting for me to notice is that um, out of those 180 million users, there are about 11 million so-called professional users. Those, those, those are the guys who use AutoCAD or Inventor or Maya. And the rest are consumer users, most, mostly kids. The average age is about nine years old, I think. And the cost of the apps you see in the iPads, they're mostly like mobile apps, uh, is about $5 or, or free. And it's kind of exciting to think that that's what, you know, not just by us, by many more groups, kids are learning more about design at that early stage. Uh, and that's, that's uh, in a way interesting. So anyway, to go back, so these are all the spaces on the, far, on the left that we normally cover as a company. And since 2009, we've been exploring life as a new design space and also material sciences. And, uh, and the, the group in particular that I'm part of is called the Bio Nano Programmable Matter Group. Uh, we couldn't find a shorter way to encompass all the things we're covering. So we have, if you have uh, suggestions, let us know. Um, but uh, but this, is, this is our mission, and we, we look to, to partner with uh, thought leaders and scientists uh, across the world to co-envision these new design paradigms that for the most part are yet to be solved in our view, or at least yet to be rationalized um, as, a, as a design and engineering practice. Um, that's where people like, like uh, Art, who's here, not last time I put you on the spot, Art, is, is how we've been working with people in, the, in that respect. So I'll start with some examples of what our group did back in 20, 2010, 2011. Um, this is not our work. This is a space called DNA origami. And it uses DNA as a structural material. It relies on the fact that DNA is so predictable in the way it folds, A with T, C with G. And people, since the early 1980s, with somebody whose uh, his name is Ned Seaman, started to uncover the fact that because it's so predictable, you can create structures with that. Uh, and in 2006, um, Paul Rutherman, who's a scientist at Caltech, uh, provided this seminal paper that actually took the space of, you know, actually conceived the word DNA origami and, and took that design space to a new level. And this is part of the work that results from, from, that, from that first paper. So basically you can create these arbitrary structures at the nanoscale, right? Um, and, you know, it's so, so, okay, so it's cool that you can create these nanostructures. Uh, and uh, the perception might be by even in, or especially in academia, is that those are cute and they are, uh, you know, nano toys at most. But that is changing right now. What is happening right now is that people are starting to rationalize more and more that the fact that you can control matter at the nano scale, which is effectively what this is letting you do, and cell biology works at the nano scale, uh, enables you to interface with cell biology in ways that maybe we, we couldn't do so easily before. And, and again, this is, um, work, let me skip this slide, I'm going to show it next. Um, this is again work now by uh, another group. This is Sean Douglas, Ido Bachelet, and George Church. They took that further and they created this um, robot, this nano robot, that uh, carries these drugs inside of it. Uh, it's made out of DNA, so it's made out of the same technique that um, I just showed you before. Um, but now it's been functionalized to be able to uh, unload its cargo, which are these drugs, antibody fragments, only when the clamshell is open. So normally it's closed because of those locks, uh, but when it's in the presence of a certain type of cell, it would be unlocked and release that payload. And that payload in particular, in, in the case of what their work, uh, what they showed in a, in a Petri dish, was to actually induce the death of the cells where, where that payload would, would be exposed to. And then, so that's your actuator mechanism. So, so then they added a sensor mechanism, which are the locks. So the locks would only be released in the presence of cancer cells. So they fine tuned the locks to say, only release in the presence of cancer cells. And of course, more specific to that, an, an acute case of leukemia, a certain marker in the surface of those cells. And therefore they showed that um, you could 
selectively target uh, cancerous cells. And even though it's done in a in vitro fashion, you would imagine, you know, in the next five, seven years, uh, this technology could be used when you go to, to the doctor. And, 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 and instead of having an invasive chemo treatment, you would have a very selective treatment that would um, maybe create a mild fever, and after that, there are no more cancer cells. So that is not yet okay, that happening, but it gives you a, a vector of where this, where, where this could go. Now, our, we're excited about this technology. We like to always show it because it's one of our first examples of our collaboration uh, with, with other research groups in the sense that we help create parts of the design software that was used to, that can be used uh, um, to create these types of structures. Uh, it was used after this initial structure was created, but you can see here an example of uh, somebody uh, designing schematically on the left, but being able to visualize the clamshell structure on the right. And those little orange points are the attachment points to the things you want to attach to, like the drug, the, the, the antibody fragments that were created. Again, it's a different kind of way of, it's a different way of thinking about design in the sense that it's all self-assembling. Maybe that wasn't very obvious, but uh, when I say that A binds with T, C with G, uh, these structures self-assemble. But what is, what is interesting is that if you didn't have software to streamline that process of design, and you had to work with these little rules and use, let's say, MATLAB or use something else to be able to gradually create your structures, it would take you a lot of time. So um, part of what we're trying to solve as, as people that have some understanding of design and trying to understand these new design spaces is how do we de-skill these, these new domains so that uh, you don't need to have two PhDs, one with biology, one with computer science, uh, and be able to create value out of it. Um, Another way of thinking about it is um, imagine that the whole mobile industry today of applications that are built around your iPhone um, were based on the fact that you had to create all your applications using machine code or assembly code. It wouldn't, there would just be such a small group of people being able to create those applications. So gradually, we're part of that ecosystem uh, where our role seems to be to push the boundaries of how sophisticated can design tools become so that more sophisticated technologies and applications can be created, which in turn create more sophisticated tools. So it's, it's a loop and we're excited to be part of it. So I'll skip this. This is how you know, it actually looks. And uh, I'm going to show you a demo that I just showed in the hour before, but I think most of you were not here before. Uh, but it, it gives you an, an, an idea of how this different kind of um, design thinking may work, um, and, uh, and I'll play it along. And Don, I'm sorry, you're going to see it again, if that's OK with you. Um, so I mentioned that um, it's a bottom-up approach to design. So you have these rules, like in DNA, A with T, C with G. And I'm going to now show you another set of rules. And this is a simulation, OK? So it's a very quick simulation. And these are the two rules that I, that I uh, uh, embedding into the system. The first rule is that you have these pairs of, of red and green parts, particles or spheres, that are attached to each other, and that bond doesn't break, and it's pretty strong, but there's freedom to move. And the second rule is that you have all these parts of the same color that attract to each other, but that force is weaker uh, than the, the, first, the first rule. So for those who have some biology background or chemistry background, I'm basically approximating a covalent bond and a weak bond. That's all. But I'm not really saying it is because I'm not putting any quantitative data into it. Uh, I'm just creating these rough rules to come up with something out of it. Um, so who wants to be bold enough to think, uh, to, to imagine what, what pattern, what design would emerge out of these rules? Circle? OK. Who else? A zipper, okay, awesome. So, okay, so I'll just play it. So this is just live on my computer. And uh, you can see it creates these stripes, which, uh, you know, equate to, let's say, something like a, a dye block copolymer that I'm not going to go in detail, but it, it, it behaves like this because you have equal concentrations of one material versus the other, and everything is exactly the same. Um, but I can, I can turn, you know, I can ask 
I can I can use this to to in, inquiry uh, um, inquire on on what um, on what other things I might imagine happening. Um, so for example, now I'm going to turn off the the force that attracts the red parts, and this one is actually easier. Um, so anybody wants to guess? And this is my last question. I promise. No. Yeah. A ball. A ball. Okay. Cool. So you get not a ball, but it's because it's in a 2D space. But yeah, great, right? I mean, you get the red parts around, don't attract each other anymore. The red greens are still attracted to each other, but they have this hanging red part around it. So you get something that looks like some type of micellar structure. And it's not in a 3D space because all the forces are applied in a, in a 2D space, but I can potentially you know, just move one of the sets a little bit below and then I play it and now I get you know, something more similar to the ball, to your point. Where I can, I can, uh, you know, replace the spheres with actual molecular structures and let those interactions play out in a different way. So, this is how we started. We started to. I'll go back to the presentation. Um, we started to um, think of this as, as, you know, can self-assembly be a, a, a way of, of um, a different kind of design that st still requires maybe different. You know, there's a pattern that you need to understand um, that we're starting to uncover. That was one of the questions we had. So for example, I, I, I could have started this way. I could have started by showing you these structures and then ask you, what are the underli underlying rules behind them? And what we learned anecdotally is that um, it seems to be more like a learned behavior, like learning to multiply and, and divide. Um, once you see it, you start to understand more, more how it works. And also, Anecdotically, it seems that uh, adults, we as adults feel, you know, if, if there is a notion of a self-assembly IQ, we adults tend to have a low self-assembly IQ. And kids, for some reason, maybe because they try really hard until they find it, they can quickly converge to the, to the, um, to the pattern, at least anecdotically. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think we've done this in any scientific way. So um, here's a more robust example of that in, in uh, 25, thousand particles here and now we can start to truly approximate how this um, simulation behave, um, equates to what's really happening in, in let's say again in this case in a dye block copolymer. Uh, here are more examples. This is a liquid crystalline polymer and two parameters were changed and it's kind of fun to see how you know live uh, like in live simulation you can see how the patterns change dramatically and that's important even at our scale because to the extent that this represents the faces of a different of, of a material, these different faces translate into different properties of the of that material. Uh, how elastic that material is, how stiff it is. So being able to get this multi-scale understanding of of, uh, of a particular design space seems important. Um, and this is these are things that. You know, scientists have been researching for, for many, many decades. Um, and all we're trying to do is come up with rough approximations of those simulations and see if we can get some way to inform or bias our design direction. Here are more examples. I'm going to skip it just to, to move ahead. And uh, so, we, so back in 2012, we, we started working. So there, I, Art, you're there. So we started working with a number of different people. and, and uh, and we, we soon realized that that wouldn't scale. Uh, we created great collaborations, but that wouldn't scale because the space is so virgin. I mean, biology is a design space, uh, or, or material <coughs> science is a design space. There's so many opportunities out there. And we, being a software company, we said, well, we're going to then create a platform that we're going to call Project Cyborg, and we're going to have the following design goals for it. So we wanted it to be end-to-end. -end. We wanted it to be multi-scale, multi-domain. We wanted to help descale the space so that more people can be involved in, in the solutions that are, seem to be so fundamental to, to you know, more than creating the next Angry Birds app. Uh, and like, for example, a cancer therapeutics application that we can help people create that. We want it to be open. We wanted to use computation not just locally on your computer, but on the cloud. So uh, that was very important. But we also wanted to harness biology as another source of computation. And I put biology in brackets because biology and other kinds of 
matter that we can program as well. Um, and ultimately, we, want, we wanted to up help upgrade these new domains like synthetic biology, like 4D printing, bioprinting, etc., into a more mature uh, design and engineering practice that is subject to repeatable processes, that is subject to all these things that we take for granted in a way uh, in, in spaces like manufacturing and architecture and so on. So, uh, so that's how we started, and I mean, a little bit on the biology as a source of computation. On the left, there is a, there's a, there's a, a data center, that's, you know, with all these servers. On the right, that's not a data center, those are pre-readers, TCAN pre-readers, of biological samples and we like to put them both co-located because you know eventually we'll get to a point where they're both seamless I mean seamlessly taken as different sources of computation so uh, this is the space we're covering our group uh, from inorganic to organic from nano to to human scale I show you a little bit of, of, of the things we did on, on the bio nano side and uh, I'll finish by showing you a little bit of other spaces too uh, this is a work done with MIT, with Skylar Tibbetts. Uh, I'm going to play it really fast. I'm not going to let it play. But what is interesting about this project is it combines new hardware, new wetware, new software to be able to create these sensors that one designs in, in, in Cyborg, which is, again, now, now everything I'm showing you is now done in Cyborg. So one just um, um, paints some, some pattern in this grid and that pattern is then translated into the actual um, molecular representation of what we need to put to be able to uh, then uh, sense a certain molecule of interest. So the, the team that we work with had to hack an inkjet printer to be able to introduce new, these new kinds of reagents. But bottom line, what this means is that even though this was a proof of concept, you can imagine a future where using something like this you can print, let's say, the surface of a wall, and when that, and when a certain molecule of interest, a pollutant or something like that, would be present, that pattern would be visible, or on your gear, or on whatever you're interested in. And what you saw over there was the game of life. If you're familiar, are you, do you know what the game of life is? I mean, okay, cool. So, what that was trying to show is that you can also superimpose those displays, and then be one the input to the other, and then start to create some type of computation or state machine into it. So again, this is a proof of concept. This is done by, uh, we, we help create the software for it, but this is done by Skylar Tibbetts in the Little Devices Lab at MIT. Uh, and uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting example to show you guys um, about what's going on. Also with, with Skylar, uh, we started to work with uh, programmable materials. This is a still human scale, lifelike uh, no, uh, behavior. Uh, this is a spoiler of a car uh, using carbon fiber. Um, and uh, you can see it changes based on environment, environmental conditions. Um, let me change more. Uh, let me move really quick. Here's. Uh, sorry. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, let me pause it and then. So, just a, one quick note on. Uh, oops, no way to pause it. Um, okay, I'll pause it. Um, so quickly, what was going on in the slide before is if you think about manufacturing today, um, many people will think of robotics, electronics, et cetera. What Skyler and we're helping him to some extent uh, are thinking, uh, all of us are thinking, is to think of manufacturing as a world where sensors and actuators are ingrained in the materials themselves. Um, so in other words, there are no robotics, there are no electronics, and yet you can have fully functioning machines that are potentially less error prone. This is very much, it's still very early, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's something that it's, it's evolving. And again, we're using the same principles of this uh, self um, you know, organizing behavior that I just showed you before. That's the common thread across, the thread across all these different things. Uh, let's see, yeah, great. So here's, here's one example and then Oh, there were more examples here that I skipped. Let's see. Uh, here's uh, uh, this one in particular. It's um, oh here. So you can see here. This is the the flap. Here's inside an engine. Uh, let's say of an airplane. 
that opens and closes based on environmental changes like uh, changes in temperature or changes in pressure changes of, of air pressure changes, etc. So again, it gives you some some idea what's what's happening in this space. So here's again that that jet engine. Um, let me now show you quickly other things that we've been uh, exploring. Uh, here's a project, again, also not done by us initially. This is called Sugar, Sugar Babe, and it's uh, the, 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 the artist who led this project. Her name is Dimit Streb, and she worked with a number of highly prominent scientists. For those of you in the space, you know, people like Bob Langer are, you know, very prominent scientists. And what they did is that they created this ear um, that has human DNA from Van Gogh himself. Uh, apparently from a stamp that he licked, and also has other kinds of DNA, like mitochondrial DNA from a direct descendant of a relative of Van Gogh. Uh, and they were able to, you know, have this ear form with, with you know, from tissue. Um, so what we are ex working with, some of these same researchers, especially um, uh, Demut and Charles Bacanti over there, is that we're creating a, um, a design space in Cyborg that allows somebody to just design an arbitrary structure that is then translated through a number of, of steps into the code that needs to go into the bioprinter that we're also hacking to be able to print tissue. Okay, or not tissue, to print cells that would eventually fuse into forming tissue. So that's, that's a project that you may wonder um, uh, why are we doing an art project? So first, uh, it, it follows the same self-organizing principles that I just showed you before. Now you, you print cells that fuse on their own. We don't fully understand how, but they become tissue. Second, even though it's an art project, if you think about the ramifications of being able to understand how we can print tissue, you might imagine one day in the future how, let's say, you have some um, you know, terminal condition or very difficult condition and we need to test you know, 100 drugs on you, but we really can't do that. So you might imagine how taking uh, skin tissue, for example, and being able to um, uh, reprogram it to become tissue of interest for that particular set of drugs might give you an understanding without testing on you of what will work, what wouldn't. And it's almost like doing a physical simulation. In fact, there's a company called Organovo that we've been interfacing with that is based here, also in San Diego, that is doing that exactly. I mean, they're not doing it yet at, at a personalized level, but they're, they're basically giving, printing tissue as a service to pharma companies who want to screen their drugs with them. And that also has other ramifications, like you don't need to test with animals uh, and, and all the implications that has, et cetera. So it's an interesting area for us to explore at a different scale, maybe that what I just showed you before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this if it lets me, it's already showed it. Um, What's, doing, what's causing the flex change there, Carlos? It's, uh, it's a material that is printed. I'll show you, um, actually, I'm going to show you something that exemplifies that even better. Um, it's something like this. Um, let's say you have this strand, and this strand is composed of two types of materials. It's 3D printed, by the way, this strand. This strand one material is water expanding and the other one doesn't, doesn't expand in the presence of water. In this case, the, sens the sensor is water. In, that, in the other, other case, it was heat. Okay, but it doesn't matter. The point is that um, as you distribute that material in different ways across the, diff across the joints, you're going to force the final structure to bend in a very determined, deterministic way. Uh, so that's, that's more or less the principle. You embed another kind of material that acts as the sensor uh, and, and actuates the form in a certain predetermined way. And that, by the way, is a perfect example for software and design tools, right? Because you don't want to be creating the rules little by little because you would only reach so far in being able to create something very sophisticated. So what we're trying to do is to create design tools that help streamline that, that process. Um, and, uh, and again, more examples of that I'll, I can show here. Um, Again, this is work done with Skylar Tibbetts and Stratasys as well, who's the 3D printing company that we work with. Um, this particular project, we were not involved. The one before, we were. Um, all these MIT guys like, love to show their logos, so 
they always show it whenever they can. <laughs> so they're great guys. Uh, so uh, and here's a little bit more. Let me show you um, uh, slightly. And Art has been working with Skyler, of course, too. Um, here's here's another example uh, that it shows you a little bit in more detail um, how sophisticated these structures can be. So it starts to become, I mean, you can maybe see why we're saying gradually this will become a more of an engineering space that we will learn how to master. Uh, in fact, what I didn't show in is one example where we have these self-assembly kits that uh, Skyler and Art did together. Um, and uh, I, 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 wish I should show it at some point later. Uh, so, okay, so with that in mind, now I'm gonna, gonna step back for a second and remember I said, well, you can only create so much sophistication. You can only go to such degree of sophisticated designs if you go in this truly bottom-up approach to design. The fact is that it's not truly bottom-up, right? I mean, because if you're involved, it means that somebody has some type of design intent in mind. So the other half of what our group is trying to do is how to create tools that help you capture that design intent, uh, explore all these possible solutions, and being able to converge to your final set, whatever that set is, based on your goals and constraints. So I'm gonna show you an example of that. Um, so again, these are you know, 3D printed structures, highly complex, you can create very complex designs. Uh, I'm gonna go quickly move on. Uh, you, you know, with 3D printing, uh, I'm going back and forth between biology and 3D printing, but um, that's the world we live in, to, to be very clear. With the kinds of things that things like 3D printing afford you to do is to create this infinite gradient of materials. Does that make sense when I say that? You know, if you can simultaneously print two different materials, in theory, you can create a gradient between the two. And, and suddenly, now you have the ability to create things that maybe you never thought you could. Like, for example, your eyeglasses don't need hinges because you just change the properties of the material in some anisotropic fashion that would only bend in a certain way. And those kinds of things is what things like 3D printing and, and, and bioprinting eventually and 4D printing afford us to think of. Um, and and uh, you know, in a way, complexity comes for free. I mean, you've maybe heard of that. So what we try to do, what you have such a large solution set to explore, is to think also of computation um, if it came for free. And what kind of design tools you would think if computation was not anymore a scarce resource. So this little side says, what if you know, it takes you 16 cents, it costs you 16 cents to use one computer for 10,000 seconds. What if you now switch that and say, how can I use 10,000 computers for one second only? And it still costs me the same. How would you think of the problem differently? And those are the types of things we're trying to solve when you have such a large solution space to explore. Um, let me connect. So, um, again, going back, if you think about the left diagram as an example of how somebody designs today in this top-down approach, and again, this is part of what David Benjamin, who's, who's part of, of Autoist Research, um, has been thinking for a long time. Um, now you think of the right as maybe how we design in the future. And how we design in the future is not so much about sketching the actual things, but setting the boundary conditions on which a design will, would emerge. And by that I mean setting your goals, your constraints. Um, and here's an example. So the chair, for example, could be designed by defining the, 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 the ranges of the radia across the legs, okay? So I said it's gonna be across these different ranges the number of legs, perhaps, the orientation of the legs. And then when I do that, I let that run on the cloud and explore a very large solution sp space. This is very small. We've been doing simulations of 16,000 different variations. But you can see, if you don't have design tools, how are you going to discriminate from this space? It's, it's, really, it's really difficult. So I wouldn't say we're there, um, but we're we're starting to uncover that, that design space, um, and we're starting to create new ways, and again, working with David, uh, who's, who's I mean, been working on this space for 10 years, how to identify and discriminate your goals. Let's say your goals were, how can I reduce weight, but keep my structural strength, right? And keep in mind, I'm, 
talking about non-biological things. This is manufacturing. It just happens to be that they're converging. The way a, biology, uh, you know, a biochemist or a synthetic biologist works, works in similar ways. They're working with uh, this type of indirect values. So it's not, it, 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 you end up eventually with a final set that on the left, you can imagine that being a model that uh, you know, didn't need any design or any design thinking in the way I was just describing. It's the heaviest one, 10.3 kilograms. Model two has some, you know, it has this lattice, this uniform lattice in the legs, but it's still not that, uh, you know, optimized, but it's already 4.1 kilograms. And then the one in the right was produced by the techniques I just showed you before. And it was very, it would have been really difficult for a designer to think of that design on the right. So what is the role for design in that world where, you know, you're not going to directly design it. Uh, you're not going to create the most beautiful design that Don would approve, uh, but you're going to create the boundary conditions for that design to emerge. Um, and again, I keep mentioning to, buy, uh, to the manufacturing space because that's a comfortable space that we can all understand. Um, so here's an example of something we did on Project Cyborg. It's, it's an application called Project uh, uh, Make It Lighter. And uh, you start in a 3D modeling tool, you create this you know, roof, um, you, you do some modifications on it, so your typical top-down approach to design, and, and then you, you, you save that file as an STL file or a step file, and now you go into Cyborg, and you upload that file, and, and think of what's going on here. Um, that file is tessellated, is, is run through an algorithm that tessellates it and simulates the final structure. Oh, it creates a mesh. It creates a mesh that, that uh, it creates a lattice uh, out of that structure. And now that blue, you know, that purple uh, um, island, what it's doing is that that one pass takes it as your unit of evaluation. Let's, you know, one pass of it just creates one design. The fact that it's in that island iterates that design over and over thousands of times, even hundreds of times, and tries to converge to a final set. And here's you know, one top final set, or one, one set that represents extremes in this case. So the one in the center might be the most optimal. Uh, you can see how in the seams, the algorithm converged to creating more density because that's where it would have more strength that would need to be applied. Um, but again, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of your design intent plus uh, an algorithm that creates the new design. This is, um, you finally get the file and you 3D print it um, and, uh, and, and now you've got something that you can use. So using that same approach, uh, David, again working with us, has been looking at different ways to explore these spaces. So these are um, different algorithms that create different types of designs. Uh, they're all optimized according to that particular algorithm. And um, you can see here. And now I'm going to show you a slightly different you know, variation, not done with David, done with a different group. Now you're not just printing something that remains static. Now you're going to do something uh, uh, that is more related to a concept called 4D printing, although this is not exactly 4D printing, but it's still a programmable material. So here, what I, what same pattern as I showed you before, you design something in a 3D uh, tool, you import it. Um, this is not anymore make it lighter. This is uh, uh, another app built on Cyborg. Using a similar process, what you created is the, the origami representation of that shape. So it cuts, it creates from a 3D, a 2D representation, and it cuts it in a way that then, if you use a certain type of material, um, you put it in an oven, for example, it would eventually uh, fall as 2.8x, so it's pretty slow, according to your design specification. But you, you started from a top-down approach, and the software created that bottom-up representation of it. Um, Here's another example. Let me just move quickly. Here's, so here's the, the prototypical bunny that shows in every computer science lecture, uh, or at least on a SIGGRAPH uh, lecture. And you can see here the, the work. So this is work done first by one of our team members when he was at MIT uh, with Daniela Russ. This is their work. And then we just took those algorithms and put it into Cyborg. And now you can, we can recreate that uh, and predict what, what else you want to do next. So that's the pattern that we're 
looking to do with this platform. We're not looking to create totally new knowledge. We're trying to have people put their knowledge into the platform and then connect it all in these end-to-end -end solutions. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to see what else I can show you that might be interesting and then finish pretty quickly. Um, so I'll, I think I will, I will finish here. I mean, the rest of the things are more related to um, synthetic biology, and they're probably more technical. I will just finish by saying you, you can take these same approaches and, and connect things like a pharma uh, uh, pipeline, uh, where you start with a molecule of interest, uh, and, and, um, and you run it through a number of um, you run it through a number of uh, islands, and these islands are simulation islands that are within an in silico, uh, you know, computational substrate. But then you go on to an in vitro uh, computational substrate. So, so for that, you need to, you know, I'm I'm simulating molecules like I showed you before. I get a subset, I synthesize them. So now I produce them for real, uh, and then when I synthesize them, I read the results. But I'm treating the, the experimental results in no way different than my simulation results, right? So I'm still optimizing all this in a longer time scale pipeline. And then I finally go to preclinical. Um, and there I'm testing with mice, OK? And I'm t there's actually a company that specializes in testing with mice. Uh, it's almost like you have your mouse cloud here, right? <laughs> mice and they charge you per mouse, et cetera. And it tells you a little bit about the new world we're, we're getting into where everything is being merged uh, in their common patterns across these seemingly disconnected spaces. And of course, I show the Van Gogh here as an example that in the future, we would be testing with tissue, not with mice. Uh, and, uh, and I think I will, I will finish there by just saying, uh, uh, this is how just, oh yeah, something probably interesting to show is how Cyborg works, a little bit of insight over, over how cyborg works. On one, on one end, we want anybody to design something with little skills and produce value out of it. So that's, that's what this, um, this part is about. Uh, you can just model something in 3D and you know, it doesn't require lots of skills and you can create something. Uh, we also want people to visually program these nodes to create new meaning out of what is out there. And we also want people to open a node and program it in Python or in JavaScript or whatever they want to program it, as long as you can put a Python wrapper around it. And that's important for us because basically what we're creating is this open guts application framework. So you as an end user are still exposed to how things work. And if we do so, we think that uh, we are helping enable these new design communities. To give you an example, let's say that there are millions of people using this. Their next, you know, make it lighter app that they can print, et cetera. Even if 1% actually gets and learns how to program uh, these little nodes, that's probably more than anybody working in the space uh, from, as researchers. And if you take 1% of that and those who program are the smallest set, that's still probably going to be more than, let's say, the 1,000 people who work in DNA origami. So, that's this, this continuum that is actually based on what I learned and working in this same company as Don uh, relates to a, a pedagogy principle called proximal zones of development, which is established by somebody called Vygotsky, if you're familiar with that guy, and talks about how to create these um, overlapping uh, regions of mastery. You're never at a point where you cannot make that bridge to the next level. So that's, that's part of what is infusing that, that work. In, uh, and again, uh, at the end, we all see you know, biology, manufacturing, et cetera, as eventually um, being you know, designed under a common platform. And, uh, and I'll finish there. And thanks for your time. Yeah. Uh -huh. starts to bring in some relational dynamics. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any thought of, uh, or any kind of imagination about what it means to be in an ecology space rather than in a biology space, where you have, uh, you're starting to look at how 
different structures affect each other and different agents? And is there any? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, we. So, so let me. Um, I actually have Cyborg here running. So, um, so this is how Cyborg looks, and to the extent that. Um, it's, uh, so I just moved the, the node to the island and I was just playing. Um, but uh, I, I can program anything I want in it. It's just a programming environment that gives you hooks to lots of computation and gives you hooks to optimization services that you can use on top of that lots of computation that you can use. So I can, I can you know, double click, let's say, the unfold algorithm. Uh, can you take like two chains and have them affect each other? Yeah, I mean, I'm, to the extent that it's just a programming environment, you can do that. Um, what, but what you can do beyond that is you can then explore how those two chains interact with small variations that otherwise will make it amazingly difficult to explore. That's, I think, the, the, one of the key values that we bring, I suppose. That you're not just thinking in, in, one in one linear direction, you can explore a vastly parallel solution space all at once. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what kind of work is being done to give guidance to how to think about? I mean, it's one thing to say, "Oh, I'll choose four four legs instead of three. Yeah. Or I wish to minimize weight. Yeah. Something. But but um, the solution space of the thing you were trying to create more abstractly construed. A lot bigger than how many legs you're going to use. Yes. Yes. So um, every, every, everything that is a parameter here um, and anything you're looking at, so here, the, whatever I'm interested in doing, um, it's, it's uh, let's see over here. So any, any parameter is subject to be explored. That's one of the things we, we're allowing anybody to do. Your comment is, what if I explore, and with every parameter that I explore, I create an n-dimensional space where n is the number of parameters that I'm exploring. So as I'm adding more and more parameters to explore, how can we um, provide guidance, I think you said, to, to the user who's not an optimization expert and really wants to solve some particular problem without necessarily understanding all the dynamics that are going on. That's a really tough problem. Uh, and we are starting by working with the people who are experts in these different optimization problems and seeing if first they can, if this tool can help them solve what they're trying to do in a, in a faster way by creating you know, data visualizations of what they're trying to create, et cetera. Um, I think to be able to say that anybody can optimize a highly complex problem by doing more than just setting the high level goals, um, it's a little bit more of a difficult task at this point. Um, at the very least, it means to me, at least today, that there's no specific framework that you, that you can, without specializing it, will work exactly as it is for any kind of problem. What I mean by that is that the, for example, the search algorithm to search through that solution space cannot be the same across different domains, domains or different problem sets. So how you need to, today at least, understand a little bit more about that search algorithm to be able to come up with an optimal set. Um, so yes? Yeah. Do you have a separate tool for visualizing the n thousands of chairs, or are you using a slider on the existing tool? 
to visualize the chair. So I mean, you could be visualizing it wrong. As you said, boundary conditions, I'll show you. Yeah. So Minimum analysis, slide them on that. You could do that. But a, a lot of the interest could come through good visualizations of the space. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, we're building those tools right now. Here's an example. You can see it is all, you know, like um, not very clear. But um, here are examples of work that we, you know, taken from people like David Benjamin and embedding in our tools right now. You can see here in the example of the chair how uh, you're exploring in this case displacement uh, versus amount of material. So you can equate material, amount of material to weight, you know. Uh, and displacement to structural strength. Does that make sense? You know, the, you apply a, a force against it, and then you can see here against the different designs, you see how each of these solutions uh, plays out. So it's not showing 1,000 yet, but you can see a lot of it right now. I don't think we have a, yet a, go, a good solution. It's, it's a design problem in itself, but it's something we're actively exploring, and we, we have a lot of stuff that maybe I can show you offline if you're interested. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one, one thing that's really great about technology research is that you get to invent a future and figure out what it's like to live in that future. And this, in, this future that you've invented here combines, you know, computation, engineering, uh, biology, and design in ways that I've never really seen before. It's really exciting. And for those of us at a university, how do you think we might reimagine, uh, you know, a social science or an engineering undergraduate curriculum so that, you know, the next generation is prepared to live in, in this future universe that you're inventing? Yeah, well, thanks. I wouldn't say we're inventing, but we're hopefully we're enabling. And I would just say um, a good example is the meeting before this one. Don and Carol uh, brought these uh, researchers, uh, amazing researchers in, in, in synthetic biology, to, to have a discussion with, with Don's team and, and with me. And you could see that today is like two different worlds today. But um, to the extent that there are bridges and, and there's a common ground that helps unify efforts, and you may think as a designer as what they're producing as new kinds of materials with different kinds of properties. And they can see the value of design tools that abstract the complexity of what they aim to create. I think that would create uh, an amazing, you know, uh, you know fertile uh, ground for, for creating all kinds of things into the future. New economies that will bloom out of these efforts. And, and uh, I, I think that's one way to approach it. I think another way is what I showed about this uh, example of thinking in a different way about design. Maybe we are, maybe we're a lost generation when it comes down to self-assembly, you know, like we're done, we're always gonna think in this top-down approach, we're always gonna splice things and cut them with our hands like we learn as kids. But if our kids can think of self-assembly as just another strategy in their set of tools when they approach a problem, um, when they become the next engineers and scientists and artists and all that, they may come with totally different solutions that we could ever imagine. So um, that's, that's another point to, uh, to answer your question, I guess. And do you think we could get some of these ideas into an undergraduate curriculum? I mean, could you imagine a yeah, most, class? Yeah, most definitely. Like Not even undergrad. I mean, like, I mean, some of these things can be done at an elementary school level, you know, but most definitely for the undergrads. So if, it's, if it can be done at an elementary school level, you might even be able to get uh, faculty members. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, and you know, to be clear, yeah, it, without their, their efforts like iGEM, maybe, have you, have you guys, has anybody heard of iGEM? Nobody? Okay, so iGEM is a competition. Have you heard of US uh, First Robotics? That's a, okay, so great. So iGEM is like uh, that competition, but it's all about synthetic biology. It's, it's, IGEM stands for International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. So all these students from all over the world, undergrad students, come to MIT every year. Now it's too big that they need to go to the conference, a big conference place in, in Boston, and think about new ways of uh, adding functions in biology that didn't exist naturally, and producing some type of, um, sometimes it's just a proof of concept, sometimes it's a concrete application, but that is happening, you know, and, and there are UCSD teams, I guess, I hope, uh, I'm sure, uh, 
But uh, the more of that can happen and the more it can happen in an, in an interdisciplinary fashion, I think the stronger our solutions will become. So, so it's not, you know, things are happening already in a way, you know. Uh, yeah? It seems like another thing, I mean, there's the, the, huge space to crawl around in. Yeah. It seems like another thing a tool like this could do for a designer is to introduce them to parts of the space that they wouldn't have thought about. Not that it has to be the optimal part of the yeah. space. But, you know, just to be able to see, you know, Dawkins did this book, The Blind Watchmaker, many years ago. Mm -hmm. a program that, and, think, and it seems like we haven't, from a design perspective, supported people in doing as much what they do well. Oh, that's interesting. And then you might follow up on that part of the space. But you get locked, you need to sort of cognitive hysteresis. You get locked into these design solutions that even if you didn't climb all the space yeah. and find the optimal thing, you could find other interesting ones that would interact with people then looking in a way that they wouldn't have looked or yeah, totally. I mean, another way, another angle of that is that you, if we can increase the bandwidth of interaction, um, you get other insight. And that's something that art actually next to you has been working on by being able to do things like augmented reality of uh, molecules that you're, you know, grabbing with your hands, but you're actually looking through an iPad or a tablet. And just the fact of having that angle and that perspective, it, it gives insight that normally people don't have when they're working in that space. So it's, um, I, I completely agree with you. I don't know, Art, do you want to add to that? I mean, you're... Uh, no, not really. I, you know, I, I, it's a complicated uh, process. And uh, I think one of the issues, I think, is that there's a lot of disparate knowledge that goes into these different islands Mm -hmm. a function, and I think the real problem is is uh, kind of integrating mm -hmm. integrating that knowledge. Uh, and I mean, it's possible that this tool could do that if there were. Uh, what's not clear to me is how you know. So so you get into this environment, yeah, and you define your, you define a problem in the design space. Uh, how does that get captured and transferred to other people? Right. In other words, uh, will there be kind of a repository of, of design uh, solutions and, right. and approaches yeah. that will enable people to use things that they, that they may not have thought of? Yes, exactly. That's, that's part of the goals of what we're trying to do. That's why it's... How Yeah, that's true. So, so some of the things we're exploring um, is, uh, you know, let's say uh, here's, here's something we're doing or we're proposing for um, a DARPA grant with, led by uh, UC Boulder, Ryan Gale. And um, each of these nodes, it's a different tool. And in fact, connecting to your work, let's say we have a molecular viewer here. And it happens to have some library that you want to charge for. Um, so we need to establish mechanisms so that people can actually create nodes. And those nodes can become opaque if they want. And, and they can also be monetizable if, if, if uh, people want to. So all that is being built. In fact, um, as of in the next week, we're going to be able to charge for cloud usage if you reach a certain threshold. We're like, we really want to make this open to everybody, but computation costs us. <laughs> so everybody we're thinking will have some type of quota, and if you exceed that quota, you can, you can wait for, have, for computation to be replenished, and, and that's fine. So maybe you know, academic students will you know, be like that. Or you can pay to increase the amount of computation you want to use. But along those lines, we can also add things like, in, if you want to use this node in particular, there's a markup that goes on top of the computation needed that goes to the guy who created it. So we, we want to create this marketplace uh, down the road that, that is, enables this type of um, innovation, I suppose. A molecule store. 
<laughs> well, all kinds of things, right? But yeah. So, yes. Uh, one biological, very important biological thing that you yes. mentioned okay. is evolution. Yes. And evolution is probably just the, the most significant self-designed yes. environment that you have. I mean, going back to Carl Sim and some of these these uh, earlier attempts at using evolution as a design principle, yes. I think, is important. And I, I don't know if it's I, built into this. Yeah, yeah, I, I mentioned it as part of the search algorithm. Oh. Uh, and I should have been more clear. So uh, the, we treat it in two different ways. One is, yes, we use things like genetic algorithms on one end that helps us converge. But it's not, it's not the only algorithm, by the way. I mean, it's one of them. But in biology, is the only one to kind of self-design and self-converge you know, converge to a space. So when we're looking at biology as a source of computation, it is through, ne through selection mechanisms that by working with different research groups, we try to embed the design goals that we're trying to achieve or they're trying to achieve, uh, and we read that data from those, from those experiments. So when it's about biology, it's only evolution as your, as your algorithm for convergence. But when it's not biological processes, it can be, it can be evolution or it can be something else. That's the way we're treating it. Maybe we're wrong, but that's, that's where we're looking at it. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, not, not necessarily just, uh, let's say, optimization through yes. genetic algorithms, but in fact, programs that change yes. over time based on fitness yes. for the, the, the goal. Yes. So it's basically composed of three things. You, you define your goals, you define your parameters that you're going to explore, but you also have to have a search algorithm that would be using genetic algorithms or would be using, you know, gradient ascent or would be using something else to be able to traverse that n-dimensional space. That's, you know, technically speaking, what this thing gives you to be able to use as is or, or manipulate and, and specialize. Another question. Yes. You kind of sidestepped the issue of aesthetics. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's... How do you incorporate aesthetics into this? I mean, obviously, uh, you either have some aesthetic rules yeah. Or you have people in the, in the loop. Right. That yeah, and, and to be clear, we're not <clears throat> looking to create all these different uh, criteria. We're looking to create the underlying platform that allows you to define and model and create your own you know, heuristics for what that criteria should be. That's, but you're right. If I were to respond to that, it would be, yes, at least you need one of the two. You know, the rules that you can abstract or somebody in the middle helping you filter out. All right, well, let's thank Carlos. Thank you.